Welcome back everyone. Uh, we will continue with um, more definitions of uh, representation tree of Lie algebras. So, in this lecture I will uh, define all important uh, terminologies that will be used uh, throughout this course like uh, submodules, irreducible modules, indecomposable modules and so on. So, let us uh, begin with uh, uh, basic definitions. So, now uh, let us uh, define what is called G submodule. So, let uh, V be a G module of the Lie algebra G. So, and W be a subspace of V. So, this is a subspace which is a C vector space. So, then we call submodule. So, G submodule. So, we say W is a G submodule if whenever we take element x in G and vector v in W, then if we look at the action of x on v, so that should be inside W for all x in G and v in W. So, that means if we take the action of uh, G restricted to W, okay, then W become invariant under this action. Okay. So, W becomes G invariant with respect to, to the action of G. So, now it is easy to see that if we define this following uh, map, okay, for example, let us say pi is the given representation corresponding to the G model V. So, then we have the map uh, from G to GL of V. So, now what we can do? We can actually define this new map pi tilde from G to GL of W by the following. Let us say x goes to x V is the map that is given by pi. So, then this pi tilde is nothing but x goes to x v restricted to w. So, that is the map that we are talking about. And it is easy to see that if uh, w is a submodule, then this pi tilde that is given by x goes to x v restricted to w gives you representation of uh, g that is acting on w. Okay. So, sometimes we also call this W as a sub representation, okay, sub representation of capital V. So, like I said in the earlier class, representation and uh, modules will be used uh, like interchangeably throughout this course. So, now uh, we define what is called indecomposable modules, okay. So, here is the definition of indecomposable G modules. So, let us say V is a given G module. Okay. So, let us first define what is called decomposable, then it becomes easy to define what is indecomposable. So, decomposable means, so given a representation, let us say V, V is G module. So, then V is said to be decomposable, V is said to be decomposable if there exist two sub representations or sub modules, if there exist W1 and W2 both of them are G sub modules of capital V such that this V is nothing but W 1 direct sum W 2. Okay. So, in that case we say that V is a decomposable G module and what is indecomposable G module? If V cannot be written as W 1 direct sum W 2 for any non-trivial G sub modules, then we call it uh, 
g uh, v is indecomposable so suppose v is written as w1 direct sum w2 for some sub modules w1 and w2 then that should imply that either w1 is 0 or w2 is 0. So, if v satisfies this condition then we call v is indecomposable. So, v is indecomposable if v satisfies this this condition okay and uh, one can prove that uh, any finite dimensional representation must be direct sum of indecomposable representation okay that one can do it uh, by induction on the dimension okay let us prove that proportion because this proportion is very important okay so here is the proportion so what it says any finite dimensional G module is a direct sum of indecomposable representations G mod. Okay, how one can prove this? We will use induction. Okay, if uh, to begin with v is trivial or 0 then we do not need to worry about it. So, if v is actually uh, let us say dimension more than 1 okay, if dimension of v is either 0 or 1 then there is nothing to prove because they are indecomposable modules. If the dimension is more than 1, if it is actually already to begin with indecomposable, then again nothing to prove because it is uh, trivially uh, decomposed into indecomposable and V is indecomposable, then V equal to V, so there is nothing to prove. So, one can assume that dimension v is more than 1 and v is decomposable. So, in that case v can be written as w1 direct sum w2 and both w1 and w2 both are non-zero modules. So, that implies that the dimension of w1 must be strictly less than the dimension of v and the dimension of w2 must be strictly less than dimension of v. If it is equal then that would imply that the other one is 0. Okay? So, that means we can use induction on, on the dimension and then assume that w1 and w2 both of them are direct sum of some indecomposable sub modules. Okay? So, by induction one can assume that both w1 and w2 are direct sum of indecomposable G sub modules. Submodules of W1, W2 will be submodule of V. So, that would imply that by adding them together, we can see that V is a direct sum of indecomposable G submodules of V. Okay? So, this completes the proof of this proportion which tells us that any finite dimensional G model must be actually direct sum of indecomposable G models. So, now this actually proposes uh, many questions. So, the very first question is, so can we classify all the indecomposable models? And even if we classify, okay, 
how one can write given finite dimensional module as direct sum of indecomposable modules. So, we should actually propose an algorithm. So, this result is actually very similar to prime factorization for integers. Okay. So, given any integer, one can write that integer as product of primes okay, up to unit. So, then it is not only like theoretically one can prove that prime factorization exists. But practically speaking, given integer, how one can actually write that uh, integer as product of primes? So that will that is a big question. So similar to that, so this will be actually somewhat difficult task to say. So given representation, how one can write it as a direct sum of indecomposable representation? So there are two important problems here. Okay, the problem one. So, if we classify all indecomposable uh, G representation, that actually tells us that how to classify any finite dimensional representation because any finite dimensional representation is a direct sum of indecomposable representation. Okay. So, the first problem is classify all indecomposable, of course, finite dimensional G modules. So, because we are only interested in uh, finite dimensional representations of G. So, what will be the problem 2? So, given finite dimensional representation of G, how one can decompose this into indecomposable representation. So, theoretically we know that any given finite dimensional representation can be written as direct sum of indecomposable and that proof is very simple as it is in the in the integers. Okay, Any integer can be written as product of primes. So, very similar to that one can prove that any finite dimensional G model is a direct sum of indecomposable G model. So, this is just a very simple proof. But given finite dimensional representation, how one can decompose whether there is any algorithm to do this and so on, that is actually most uh, difficult question. So, we will uh, see later that uh, okay, for at least SLN, okay, so, because SLN being simple Lie algebra, okay, for SLN using this uh, Wiles theorem, we can see that indecomposable models will correspond to irreducible models. So, indecomposable will be same as irreducible, okay. So, this is what actually cotton killing theory tells us. So, if we actually it is easy to see I will leave it as exercise. So, it is a very simple exercise for any Lie algebra G. If we take uh, irreducible module okay, finite dimensional irreducible module G module. So, then suppose V is finite dimensional irreducible module, then V must be indecomposable module. Because irreducible by definition, the only sub modules of V will be trivial and itself. And if V is decomposable, then it will be decomposed into W1 direct sum W2, both W1 and W2 will be non-trivial representations. Okay, That would actually lead to the contradiction. So, that is why all the irreducible models must be indecomposable. But the converse need not be true in general. But if we take simple Lie algebra or semi-simple Lie algebra, then this is true. All indecomposable modules will correspond to irreducible modules. So, at least using the Wiles theorem, one can see that uh, for SLN, like classifying indecomposable finite dimensional G model will, will be 
equivalent to classifying all the irreducible modules. Using the highest weight theory, one can actually classify all the irreducible SLR modules. So, that is what we will be doing later in this course. Okay. So, our ultimate goal, so this is the ultimate goal to classify all finite dimensional irreducible SLN models. Of course, once we understand uh, the representation theory of SLN, then there is a close relationship with this representation theory and representation theory of GLN. So, using that close re relationship, we can also understand the representation theory of GLN. So, now uh, let us move on. I guess I defined uh, uh, sub module and then indecomposable module. So, we will now define uh, irreducible module, anyway I used uh, the notion already, but irreducible module means it is a G module and that has 0 and V itself as only sub modules. Okay. V is said to be irreducible G module if 0 and V are the only G sub, mod sub modules of V. Okay. So, the notion of irreducible modules, they are very important. That is because indecomposable modules are same as irreducible modules and uh, Wiles complete reducibility tells us that any finite dimensional representation of SLN can be written as direct sum of irreducible modules. So, that will actually uh, reduce our problem of classifying finite dimensional representation of SLN to classifying all irreducible modules. So, first we will do this for SL2 and then later for SL3 and then after that we will generalize everything to SLN. Okay. So, now we have this notion. So, once we have introduced this notion, we can actually make some uh, actually trivial remarks. So, for example, if V is uh, irreducible G module, so then we can pick a vector and then look at the smallest possible sub module that contains V. So, if you pick a non-zero vector, then capital V will be the smallest module. Okay. So, smallest with respect to the inclusion. So, let us start with, okay, this is the observation, observation. Okay. So, let V be a, V be an irreducible G module. So, then one can pick a vector capital V in V. So, we can take any vector okay, for any for any vector V in capital V. If we look at this smallest module that actually uh, containing V, okay, this is the intersection of all G sub modules containing V. So, this is what the sub module generated by V, okay. This is the sub module, okay, G sub module generated by V. So, one can easily see that because V is being irreducible, there are no other sub modules other than 0 and itself. So, because V we picked as non-zero element in capital V, so that would imply that the sub module generated by V that is the smallest module that containing V must be exactly capital V. So, this is a very important observation and this will be used again and again in this course. 
Okay, similar to this, we can also talk about a submodule generated by any subset. So, let us define that. So, let uh, V be a G module and we can actually take any subset S of V. Okay, this is just a subset. So, then we can actually define what is called submodule generated by the subset capital S. So, usually we denote it by this, this notation. So, what is this? So, this is by definition G sub module generated by capital S. So, what is this? This is the actually the smallest module that contains capital S. So, it is easy to see that intersection of G module will be again G module. So, you can take any arbitrary intersection that does not matter. So, if we take all possible modules that containing S, that set must be non-empty because capital V is there. So, in particularly what we can do, we can take intersection of all submodules W, W contains S and W is a G submodule of capital V, then this intersection will be actually valid inside uh, any module capital V and this intersection contains capital S okay? and one can easily see that this is the smallest submodule that contains V and this is defined to be the submodule generated by capital S. Okay? So, what is this property? Let me write it as a proportion. If W contains S and W is a G submodule of capital V, then definitely W contains this submodule generated by capital S. Okay? So, to explicitly write down what will be the spanning set of capital S, we need the notion of universal Olympic algebra. So, actually uh, without telling that one can actually work inside GL of V and then try to get the spanning set for this uh, capital uh, sorry the submodule generated by S. So, let us see how one can actually get that. So, this is actually very important thing. Okay. So, let us see. So, let us start with V being a G module. So, V is G module and S is a subset. Okay, let us say this V uh, G module is given by this representation pi. So, which is a map from G to G L of V. Okay. So, given x, we have this pi of x which actually we denoted by x v. Okay. So, note that inside G L of V, we have we also have a matrix multiplication or we have the composition of maps. Okay. So, this G L of V is nothing but endomorphism of V. Okay. So, in endomorphism of V, that is indeed an associative algebra. So, we also have composition of maps that gives you multiplication there. So, using that, we can actually make sense of composition of two elements that actually comes from G. Okay. So, if we take X in G, Y in G, then we can talk about XV composition YV inside endomorphism of V. That makes sense. That means, we can actually allow the product x, y inside endomorphism of V that makes sense. So, now if we take this uh, G sub module generated by S, the G sub module generated by capital S. So, how it is going to look like? Let us see. Suppose if I take a vector capital S in V and x in g, then we can actually look at what is x v. So, x v is nothing but x v applied on v. Okay? So, this must be inside your submodule generated by S. Okay? So, not only that, if we take another y in g, okay, so then I can also compose y x v. So, that is y v x v, that is also inside your Submodule generated by S. So, that means 
it is actually makes sense to denote this by just symbolically x y v ok even though the multiplication y x does not make sense inside g but y x acting on v makes sense inside capital V. So, one can take the composition of y v and x v. So, that is what we mean by this symbol. For example, we say x square v by we take x v square acting on v. So, x v square makes sense inside endomorphism of v. So, that is what we mean by this. So, this is the notation we will be using. Okay. So, this is the notation. So, for example, x v y v acting on v is just will be denoted by x y of v. Okay. Now, using this one can easily see that. So, this uh, subspace one can start with the subspace span by s okay, and then take uh, all the elements of g and then keep repeatedly acting on that. So, then by taking the span of that we will be getting the g sub module. So, basically what will be this uh, g sub module generated by s. So, uh, we can take span of okay. So, we can pick a vector and then repeatedly apply element of g okay. So, we can take x i 1 etcetera x i r and then we can apply it on v and then this x i 1 etcetera x i r we can pick it from g and then this vector we can pick it from s. And if we take span of all this, so this is going to be vector subspace first of all. So, this is this is a vector subspace of capital V by definition. Okay. So, now we claim that this is indeed smallest module containing S. Okay. So, first of all S is there by allowing okay, this R we can actually take it to be greater than or equal to 0. When R is 0, we just treat this x i 1 etcetera x i r of V to be just V. Okay. This is like a empty thing applied on V which is gives back V. Okay. So, this is the notation. So, now using this we can see that the right hand side is indeed G module. So, how one can verify this? we can pick x in g and then we can pick any element in the right hand side which will be a linear combination of elements of this form. So, because of that we can just pick one of this uh, element from the spanning set. Okay. So, now if you apply x on this then what we get is just x, x i 1 etcetera x i r which is applied on v okay. which is also of the same form like this. Okay. So, this form is and this form both are same and or we are allowed to take any or greater than or equal to 0. So, that means, so this is going to be again inside this collection call this collection A. Okay. So, that is going, so that means, the right hand side is indeed closed under the action of G. So, this is all just a symbolic computation, okay. but what one should remember what is the meaning of x i 1 etcetera x i r applied on v. So, this means you keep applying the maps x i 1 v composed x i 2 v composed etcetera x i r v applied on small v. So, that is what this map means. Okay. So, now if you use this uh, then you can easily see that the right hand side is closed under the G action and S is contained in there. So, that means the right hand side contains the sub module generated by S. Now, if we take any vector V in capital S and then if you keep applying the elements of G. So, then those elements after that uh, applying elements of G must be lying inside this sub module generated by S. So, it is easy to see that. So, this uh, sub module generated by S contains the right hand side. So, that implies right hand side is the smallest module generated by S. Okay. So, this is actually kind of uh, theoretically speaking uh, very rough spanning set that we are getting it for 
submodule generated by S. So, later we will see that uh, after introducing after introducing universal and helping algebra that how to actually choose some spanning set much more cleverly. Okay. So, I will actually end with uh, another small observation. So, if we work with uh, general G module, so if we take some element from the derived algebra, so then one can easily see that the trace of that element, okay, that will must be 0, okay. So, here is the important observation. You start with V being a G module. Now, take X from the derived algebra G G. Note that the derived algebra is span of the brackets y z where y and z both comes from g. So, now what we want to do, we want to understand what is the trace of this x v. So, the trace of x v going to be, so x will be the sum of finite sum of these elements from i range from 1 to k. So, then the trace of this x v is going to be trace of these uh, elements i range from 1 to k, but note that both y i i z i leaves this v invariant. So, that means this bracket y i i z i v is going to be exactly equal to y i v times i z i v minus i z i v times y i v. So, that means the trace of this element must be 0. So, that will force that the trace of x v is 0. So, this is indeed important observation. For example, if we take w to be any sub module, then the trace of this bracket y z okay, also will be 0 when you calculate its action restricted to w. Okay. So, these informations will be used repeatedly uh, to actually classify for example, irreducible representations of SL2 and so on. Okay, we will stop here. Uh, I will continue with uh, uh, some more examples of uh, representations uh, in the next class. Thank you very much.